The Unborn Legion. This is a draft version. It fits within the universe I have been creating with my previous stories. Chapter 1 So, Cassie, when is your pup supposed to come visit us on board? Brimkia was jumping up and down in excitement at the prospect of finally meeting her human friend's daughter. Cassie smiled. Her Kishtari females were always eager to learn more about other species' kids, which they always called pups, even when the offspring was an egg, a chrysalis or a sprout. I'm looking forward to introduce you to Joy, my daughter. You humans always find nice ways of naming your pups. Joy, Faith, Hope, Hunter, Prince. Some of your names are very evocative. Kishtari naming conventions are much more formal. Cassie smiled. As a xenosociologist, that kind of conversation was a never-ending source of material for her studies. Plus, they were really pleasant. What are Kishtari naming conventions, then? I'd like to learn more about your own name. Brimkia. Oh, it's very simple. Kia means daughter in the ancient dialect, and Brim means chaos. So you are the... Daughter of chaos, my friend. They both giggled. Yes, parents give their kids antinomous names, which means that they give a name but hope for the opposite. Since my older sister was some kind of a tornado, they gave me chaos as a name in a way to conjure the spell. No more chaos in the family. One hyperactive pup is enough. Did it work? Cassie already knew the answer. Not a single bit. You know what? Some human cultures also use a similar naming convention, a fearsome name to keep the bad spirits away. But I wouldn't give my daughter the most feared name, Karen. They both laughed in good faith, although Cassie was certain Brimkia was not aware of Karen's infamous reputation. In the 22th century, humans even named a series of hypersonic missiles the HM-10 Angry Karen. Chapter 2. As they were chatting and laughing in the mess hall, a short, stocky humanoid wearing some kind of kimono entered the room. It was a female Vopkin. The Vopkin were a reclusive species from an undisclosed world. They looked like bears with a short snout, four eyes and short bluish fur. The first human ambassador to meet a Vopkin described it as an overly cheerful giant gummy bear. Brimkia waved at the Vopkin female as she was walking towards them and then turned to Cassie. Hey, you'll meet my friend Kush, Kish, today. She is the head chef of the ship's kitchen. Cassie raised a brow. Is she a Vopkin? Yes. Isn't it amazing? I bet you have never met one before. Am I right? Brimkia was again jumping up and down on her four legs, also tapping her paws together. This made a funny poof sound. Cassie opened her mouth to ask a very down-to-earth xenosociologist question. How do Kishtari clap their paws when they enjoy a show? But she was interrupted by Kish. Ladies, glad to meet you. Kish's voice was very high-pitched and faint. Funny enough, this is how Cassie imagined a life-sized gummy bear would sound like. Cassie slowly answered, glad to meet you, and showed her open hand, which was an almost universal invitation for a handshake at the galactic level. Kush shaked Cassie's hand vigorously and they both smiled. So far, so good. Meeting new species was always challenging, especially those that were not part of the diplomatic training that was given to all humans who wished to serve on Kishtari protocol ships. Kish continued speaking, her voice taking a slightly lower tone, for which the universal translator added a sorry tone hint. Cassie, I have reviewed the menu you have submitted for your daughter, Joy, which should join us tomorrow. Cassie would have guessed that something would be rejected. There was always something. Some foods were considered offensive, usually by the Zeoff, which were overly sensitive to pretty much everything. Some spices were forbidden, as they are potent neurotoxins for some of the species on board. You want to quickly kill a borlock? Nutmeg. Cassie usually tried to keep a strictly vegetarian regimen with minimal seasoning. Salt, cilantro, lemon peel, saffron, sesame, ginger were tolerated by all species on board the ship, but she wanted to have something special cooked for her daughter. She had not seen Joy in person for six months, so she wanted to cook her favourite, waffles. Kish showed Cassie the list of ingredients with two of them highlighted. I'm really sorry, but we cannot legally source eggs, and we could not find powdered milk. The last human colony we visited did not have any dairy products. Cassie was not really surprised. There were stringent rules when it came to animal products. Why are eggs illegal? 
I know I could legally import fish, shrimps, or frog meat if I wanted to. And I know I couldn't ask for beef, pork, or monkey to be served on board. But eggs? Chapter 3 Kush closed her four eyes in sequence, and then made a funny sound with her mouth. Ah, ha, ha. As per galactic legislation, consuming the unborn child of a level 16 sentient species is not acceptable. Cassie sighed. Yet another obscure piece of legislation. Hen are sentient. Oh yes, yes, they are actually quite high on the sentient scale. Humans are level 21. Kishtari are 20. Brimkia frowned and tapped her hind legs on the floor. Kush continued. Horses are 18. Fumauti are 20. She kept enumerating sentient species in no specific order. And finally, if you want to know the actual threshold, where we draw a line between cute peeps and tasty food, fish are 12, and it is not acceptable to consume the offspring of any species over 12. Cassie was scratching her head. But, 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 we are talking about unfertilized eggs here. It's not like it's killing anything that's actually alive. Still unacceptable. You will have to find a replacement ingredient. May I suggest a high-density vegetal oil combined with yeast protein powder? Cassie was mortified. This wouldn't taste the same. Could you please look up the chemical composition of egg white? I could go without egg yolk, but I need something I could beat with a whip to give the waffles their fluffy texture. Brimkia looked puzzled. The universal translator had mistranslated the last part as, I need something I could physically attack with a lashing weapon. Cassie saw her friend's puzzled face and explained, Egg whites will froth and turn into some kind of foam when vigorously shaken with a tool that mixes it with air. A whip. Kush looked up the egg white composition on her tablet. Interesting, A.K.H. Interesting, yes. We need a source of glycoproteins that react like egg albumin. Yes. She kept browsing her extensive database of ingredients and chemical compounds. Ah, found it. The mucus of the Nermian flying slug has similar composition. We have a few packs of frozen slugs in the kitchen. Now, if you will excuse me, I will need to find a way to refine the mucus. She headed back to the kitchen. Cassie turned to Brimkia. Have you ever tasted Nermian flying slugs? Oh, yes. If they're fresh, they literally jump into your mouth. But I'm glad Kish suggested she refines the glycoproteins first. You wouldn't like the taste. Cassie opened her mouth, then closed it. Brimkia continued. You would call the taste earthy with a hint of tar. Delicious, at least for a Kishtari palate. Chapter 4 The next day, diplomats and officers gathered into the ceremony hall for a social event. A large buffet was served, with a variety of carefully labelled food items cooked to please crew members from a dozen galactic species. A large pile of perfectly cooked golden waffles gave away an irresistible aroma, the kitchen crew even managed to infuse some freshly synthesized diacetyl into the mix, which gave the waffles an irresistible buttery taste. Cassie's daughter, Joy, was standing on a plastic bench playing guitar for everyone with ears to enjoy. The Zoff ambassador was wearing earmuffs, since many frequencies in human music tend to be painful to them. After playing a few traditional folk music songs, she stopped and winked to Cassie. Cassie turned to Brimkia and whispered, I have asked my daughter to learn and play a song just for you. The song is Daughters of Chaos by an old band from the 20th century named Luscious Jackson. Brimkia's eyes widened. Daughter of Chaos, that's my name. Joy tapped on her tablet, and an hypnotic drum loop started playing. She then proceeded to sing the melody and play the guitar. Brimkia looked completely mesmerized, her mouth agape and her eyes glassy. Kishtari have a quasi-mystical communion with music, but this was the first time that Cassie actually saw her friend in a trance. Some of the guests just shake their head and walked out of the hall discreetly. Insectoids dislike drums, and one of the Tahari guests looked like he needed to take a dump. When the song finished, there was a polite applause by some of the human and Borlock guests. Suddenly Brimkia came out of her trance and started slamming her hind legs loudly on the floor. More, more, that was the best song ever, woohoo! Now Cassie knew how Kishtari applauded, very loudly. Chapter 5 After the show, Cassie introduced her daughter to her favourite crew members, including the ship's commander, an old irascible Kishtari. 
Today he seemed to be in a surprisingly good mood, eating a pile of pancakes and sniffing every bite he took while rolling his eyes. Your daughter is so adorable. How old is she? She is just twelve years old. Can you imagine how talented she is? No idea. Kishtari pups take more than thirty of your human years to fully become adults. A twelve years old pup would not even be able to hold a guitar. It would chew on it, drool and shit all over. The captain laughed loudly and swallowed another large bite of his waffle. He mumbled contently, Butter flavor. So good. Crew members were congregating around the captain, Cassie and Joy. Some were quite curious, since they had never seen a human offspring before. Kush joined the group, still wearing a white apron on top of her kimono. This human recipe, waffles. Ugh, can you imagine, Cassie, that over 80% of the crew can actually eat waffles without any harm? Amazing recipe, zero toxin. My team will be packing the freezers with waffles, and we might even commercialize it on Kishtar Prime. Why not commercializing them on your planet, Kush? But what's the name of the Vopkin home planet anyway? Kush's eyes all blinked at the same time. We don't... we don't talk about our home planet. We have our reasons. Tri-Galaxy is a dangerous place. There were lots of political assassinations lately. There was an uncomfortable silence. Then the captain belched loudly. Cassie laughed. Kish's belly giggled. What? Cassie stepped back, a look of horror on her face. Kish's belly giggled some more. Chapter 6 Brimkia looked at Kush, then at Cassie with an amused smile. Oh, Kush, I didn't know you were pregnant. Congratulations, when are the buds expected to drop? The little buggers will drop in fifty daily cycles. They're halfway baked now. Ah! Ha ha ha! She stroked her belly gently, and more giggled could be heard. Cassie was not sure how to react. The situation was so weird. Kush was pregnant, and her belly giggled. So this meant... Oh! Cassie regained some composure. Congratulations for your... Offspring, Kush. Kish looked unfazed. She was obviously used to that kind of reaction to her pregnancy. Thank you. As you may have guessed, Vopkin are what humans would call marsupials, but we are not like kangaroos. Our buds, our offspring, grow directly in cavities on our belly. She carefully pulled her kimono up, showing her purple-furred belly with four little lumps of flesh protruding, four tiny heads fully formed with eyes, ears, mouths. Hi, Mum, said one of the tiny things with a high-pitched voice. Shh! You should stay quiet when we are in public. Cassie opened her mouth to speak. She had questions. So many questions. But Kush continued explaining. Our buds start reacting to the external environment early on. They also have a direct neural link to their mother's brain, so they acquire large swathes of my accumulated knowledge when I am asleep. They dream my dreams and they speak my tongue. They learn everything about my lineage, their lineage. Cassie was impressed. This is such an effective way of training kids. Human babies know almost nothing when they're born. The captain laughed loudly. And Kishtari pups are blind for three years. You don't know how easy you have it with your kids, human. Ksh continued. My species has a low fertility rate. Having kids makes a female very vulnerable. I require very large amounts of carbohydrates just to stay alive. My buds literally drain me, physically and mentally. Cassie sighed. I think you have given a very precise definition of motherhood. It is true for so many species. Do Vopkin children continue to learn after they are born? Oh yes, their brain is like a water-hungry... thing. How do you call it in human terms? A sponge, Bob. Oh, I see. A sponge. Our culture is very old and very complex. We are people of honor, and we take our lineage and our clan's memories very seriously. If parents were to die, another Vopkin from the same clan would complete the bud's education. Cassie frowned. But you are so far away from your world, and you are the only Vopkin on board this ship. You don't have any support system? No, unfortunately, it is very unusual for a Vopkin mother to be alone like this. Before Cassie could answer, Joy stepped in front of her and blurted, Oh, Mom, I want to help Kish with her tiny little baby bears. They're so cute. Kush's belly erupted in giggles. I think they like you, Joy. Chapter 7 Over the course of just a few days, Cassie and Joy became Kush's adoptive clan in a very informal way. Joy played the guitar, 
and kept singing lullabies and funny human songs. Cassie conducted lengthy interviews with Kush, learning a lot about her clan, her traditions, her lineage. She carefully recorded everything in her tablet. As a xenosociologist, she was in heaven. As a single mother, she also identified with Kush. Kush explained that her late husband was a prominent diplomat. He had been assassinated by a Tahari crime syndicate while negotiating a commercial treaty between a Vopkin space station and a neighboring Tahari commercial hub. Ah, my duty as a widow is to avenge the death of my husband, but then I realized I was pregnant, which completely changes the priorities. I need to first ensure the survival of my bloodline, and only then will I be able to find the crusty bastard who killed my husband, and kill him with a blade to restore my clan's honor. As Cassie learned more about the Vopkin culture and traditions, she was able to pull human stories of war, royalty, betrayal and honor from her digital library. Kish was fascinated with human epic stories, especially stories of sword duels from the French Renaissance. She had a thing for the Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, but then she discovered Japanese culture, and tales of lonely samurais got her hooked. She listened to the history of Nobunaga and Japanese warring clans, then to the biography of Miyamoto Musashi, a quasi-mythical bushi master. One of her buds, the quiet one, asked to be named Musashi. The giggly one wanted to be named Nobunaga. The other two were baptized D'Artagnan and Aramis. Chapter 8 A week later, the protocol ship reached its next waypoint. It was a rather large commercial hub, orbiting a large Jupiter-like planet, with spectacular rings and a string of rocky moonlets. The space station was located far from the planet, but it still looked gigantic, its shadow looming over the glacial rings. Joy and Kush were admiring the view from the large oval bay window in the ship's observation hall. Aramis asked for a song about stars, so Joy taught them a rap version of Space Cowboy by Steve Miller Band. Kush absolutely hated rap, but, but for some reason, Aramis and D'Artagnan kept asking for rap songs. They were quite good with their flow, singing in standard Earth English with only a slight accent. Kush often joked that her buds were becoming half-human and half-Vopkin culturally. They even started showing some interest towards Cassie and Joy's lineage. Unfortunately, human archives are very spotty, and Cassie could only trace her ancestors back to the 1820s Boston. What she lacked in genealogy, she compensated with human folklore, mythological tales and war epics. After singing a few barbershop songs with terrifying results, since the voices were way too screechy, the four little Vopkin buds fell asleep in their mother's warm belly nests. Joy put her guitar in her case and walked back to her quarters. Kush tied her kimono and stayed in the great observation hall for a while. A shadow moved in a corner. A swift, silent movement, then a sharp pain to her neck. She tried to scream, but no sound escaped her mouth. She fell on the side in a pool of blood. Chapter 9 I will not sugarcoat it, Cassie. Your friend might never regain consciousness again. She lost too much blood, and her brain was deprived of oxygen for too long. The doctor checked Kish's chart and shook his head. We were able to stabilize her, and I think we will be able to keep her alive long enough to reach delivery. D'Artagnan's head popped out of his nest. He turned his tiny head to the doctor and asked in standard Terran English, Will Mom ever come back to us? Her thoughts have been silent. The doctor shook his head again. I am afraid, little bud, that your mother will be in a deep sleep from now on. She will still be able to keep you warm, but you won't hear her voice or her thoughts again. Nobunaga popped out and turned to Cassie, a sad smile on his cute little face. Will you be our mom then? We will need to learn many more things before we can avenge our family's honor. And so they did. Cassie and Joy were there to welcome the four little Vopkin buds into the world. And then the training began. Chapter 10 The Tahari assassin was slowly walking a dark corridor, the thick carpet muffling the sound of his steps. The air in that small space station was warm with a musky smell, a Tahari assassin hub, one of the stealthiest compounds in the galaxy. He smiled, showing his long, yellowish fangs. Her had been assigned his next target, a prominent human politician at the Muskia colony, an easy target. 
Humans don't have such good reflexes. They're soft and they're loud. They bleed easily. He routinely touched the small but deadly plasma blaster dangling from his belt. His skin was rough and thick, but his steps were nimble. Suddenly, four hooded shadows dropped from over a ceiling pipe. The Tahari ducked and tried to reach for his blaster, but his right arm was already cut. He screamed as his limb hit the floor with a sickly thud. Four tiny Vopkin dressed in samurai armor, armed with long katana blades, surrounded him. One of them, the smallest one, then broke the silence. Finish him, Nobunaga. He's all yours.